Are you living the Christian life? Or a life full of religious rules, regulation, and outward goodness? Although at first glance they both look similar, they are worlds apart with drastically different outcomes. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about authentic Christianity versus religion. Now, most of us are very familiar with religion and very unfamiliar with authentic Christianity because so much in American Christianity and the doctrine that we gain in the American church really is religion. And if we look closely to the life of Christ and see the things that he taught, we'll discover that we're a lot more religious than we thought we were. And so I want to make a comparison today, a contrast I talked to Brian this morning, who works for Pepsi, and I said, Brian, are you going to be in here this morning? He said, no. I said, good, because you wouldn't like today's content. What is this? Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. How many of you guys have ever had it? Coca-Cola before? Everybody, right? As a matter of fact, Coca-Cola is no longer just trying to get their product out there. In fact, I think their latest goal is they want to have Coca-Cola... Uh, whether it be the actual Coke itself or a picture of it, the icon of Coke. They want it in every town of every city of every nation across the world within a two-mile radius. And as ridiculous as that sounds, in 1991 when I was in the Persian Gulf and in the middle of some unknown place in Iraq, I had no idea where we were. We stopped off uh, the side of the road. There was Saudis over there that had this little uh, tiny hut. They were selling soda and we heard that they had American... Soda over there, and we went over there, and sure enough, they actually had little tiny cans of Coca-Cola in the middle of nowhere in the desert. Wow. And Coca-Cola, I think, for many of us, actually is what we refer to when we say, you want a soda? All right? How many of you guys say, hey, you want a Coke? And say, well, what kind of Coke? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want a Coke? Yeah, I'll have a Pepsi. What kind of Coke? Oh, a Pepsi Coke. <laughs> Anyway, I want us to just picture this as authentic Christianity. If we've had Coca-Cola, then you, you know what it tastes like, right? And I remember as a kid wanting to have Coca-Cola, but my mom and dad sometimes getting King Super's brand. You guys know what I'm talking about? Have you guys occasion get... Big K. Big K. Uh, it's good, yeah? You keep telling yourself that. <laughs> Convince yourself. <laughs> if given the choice, which one are you choosing? Huh? Either. Who would choose this one? By show of hands. Anyone? Because there's an answer for both. You know, you already know me. There's an answer for both. If you're going to choose Coke, then it's because you've had the authentic taste of Coke. And you would have a preference to it. And when you try BK... Something just isn't right. You know what I'm talking about? It's just, it's just something not right. It's not, it doesn't taste just like Coca-Cola. And if you would choose the BK, then I would submit to you, you don't know the difference between the authentic. And I think in America, we have a lot of people that think they have the authentic walk with God, yet they don't even know that their entire life, maybe they were raised in a church, they have no idea that what they had been drinking all along was religion. And we have come to know it, we've come to be comfortable with it, and then when you have Coca-Cola, right? Here's what happens. You have this all the time, and then you show up someplace, and you're like, man, that is good. You ever had a Coke before? That's an Ian. You ever had Coke before? That's the best thing you ever had. Man, it's delicious. Right? It becomes refreshing. It becomes this amazing experience. Lord, please don't let me spill that. It becomes this amazing experience that we have because all we've known before is Big K. And we come to this new, fresh taste that's just delicious and it's wonderful. Ooh, Brian's ears would be burning right now. All this delicious talk of Coca-Cola. And my hope and my goal today is that we would um, begin a process of evaluation. What have we been living? What are we used to? 
I have a couple definite definitions for you. Authentic. Not false or copied. Genuine and real. I think we see authentic when you look at the Coca-Cola and then you see a copied version when you see BK. A big K. It, it's, it's just a, it's a knockoff of it. How many of you ladies ever thought you bought an amazingly nice purse only to discover it was a knockoff? It's disappointing, right? So it is in our spiritual walk. When we think we have something authentic and we, dis and we discover it's really a cheap knockoff of the authentic. Valuation. The act of estimating or setting the value of something, an appraisal, an estimated value or worth, the awareness or acknowledgement of the quality, nature, excellence, or the like of something. That's what I want us to do today. Evaluation process. What type of spiritual life do we have? What kind of walk with God? What sort of interaction do we have with Him? Is it authentic? Is it real? Or has it really been fabricated and handed to, handed to us? And when you look a little bit closer, you discover it's rules, it's regulation, it's the do's and the don'ts. Now, all of us understand what is right and what's wrong. Yes? In here in our church, uh, in fact, I just want to make a quick plug, and it's actually really early to do so, but uh, the last Tuesday in March, we'll be having another new members class. And in our new members class, you'll hear uh, a very foundational talk that we give here, which is the tree of life versus the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that's important here because you're going to hear that reference all the time and we don't always have the time to, to expound on it. But I, So I want to invite you. The last Tuesday in March, we'll be having another new members class. Uh, if you haven't gone through one, come. And then you'll hear exactly what I mean when we talk about the tree of life versus the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But in that teaching in itself, it becomes the contrast of the authentic and pure of God versus the worldly system that we've grown up in. The thing that tells us what we should and shouldn't do, and yes, there's the Bible that leads us in that, but when you follow a knowledge-based system of what I should and shouldn't do, even the knowledge of good will still lead you to death. Only life from God sets you apart where you truly experience God. And so... Many of us have grown up under a system of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We've been told what we should do, what we shouldn't do. We've had pastors give us scriptural references and say, here's what you should, what you shouldn't do. And we all know good people go to church, they don't sin, they do this, they do that. And so we have the system of what I think I should be following. Yet we don't realize what it really is, is big K. Because when you, when you really study Jesus, you discover he loves you. He doesn't love you because you come to church. He doesn't love you because all last week you made it a full seven days without really sinning big. He loves you, period. And you discover that in living in the life of God. And guys, I want to share with you that when we have an authentic relationship with Christ, it radically transforms who you are. Which brings us to our next definition. Conversion. Change in character, form, or function. Spiritual change from sinfulness to righteousness. My question to us today is how many of us, how many of us have experienced conversion? Now, I want us to just kind of think about that for a minute. I had to really think that through. You know, I grew up in the church. My parents got saved when I was 14 months old. I literally grew up in the church. And for me, I had to sort of go back and look at the process of when did God really turn my life around? And for me, it happened when I was 21 years old. Although I grew up in the church and went to a Christian school as a youngster and, and memorized lots of Bible verses, for me, it didn't authentically happen until I was 21. When I had a moment with Jesus, an encounter that began a conversion process where I was no longer the guy I was just 24 hours prior to that experience. And I think many of us have not had that experience. We've just sort of been in the church. We've been good people. We've been going uh, to Bible study. We study the scriptures. But we can't look at our life and point to a moment of conversion. If you have your Bible, I'd like you to open it to the book of Acts in chapter 22. You're reading from the New King James Version. And this is the account of the conversion of Saul. This is probably the best example of conversion because it's immediate, 
It's, it's contrasting from black to white. It's this amazing transformation in a 24-hour period where Saul, who was a, a Pharisee's Pharisee, if he were alive today, he would essentially be a seminary professor who trains and teaches other seminary professors. He knew the law as well as anybody could possibly know it. He was from the right stock, of the right pedigree. He was the, the right bloodline. He had everything going for him religiously. And so when he had these people that were teaching this foreign doctrine, as they referred to as the way, the teachings of Jesus Christ, it was heretical to him because it was absolutely contrary to everything they had been taught and grown up knowing. They followed the law to the letter. And yet you had these guys, these unlearned men, these fishermen running around town telling people, no, just put your faith in Jesus. It's not in the law. And he was furious over what they were teaching. And so he began persecuting the church as we know the church. He thought he was doing an awesome act for God by eliminating these heretics. And so he was not just persecuting, but he was eliminating or eradicating these people teaching this doctrine of the way. And he's on the road to Damascus, and we're going to discover Jesus has an encounter with Saul. Now it happened in verse 6. As I journeyed and came near Damascus at noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting and those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. Guys, I want you to understand that Saul has this encounter where this light throws him off of his horse and although nobody can hear the voice, everyone there also can see the light. There are witnesses to the account of Saul's conversion. That's important for us to know because there's many people that love to raise the fact you know that there are actually people in the body of Christ that try to eliminate the teachings of Paul because they're not the teachings of Jesus. And so you have a sect of people that believe that only the things that Jesus taught are the things that we should follow or the only things that we should listen to. How should we listen to this guy who just, he's just giving words to us. He's just a man like we are. And they eliminate the teaching of Paul. But Saul, who has this encounter with Jesus, has this amazing and enlightening encounter where he discovers Jesus. This is important because Jesus wasn't on the earth now, right? Jesus had already ascended back to heaven. This is after Jesus' ministry on the earth. Saul is persecuting the disciples that Jesus had trained and commissioned to become the church. And now Jesus intervenes in Saul's persecution, throws him off of his horse, and introduces himself. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. He has this commission, this call to the apostleship from Jesus. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise, go to Damascus. And there you will be told things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see... The glory of that light being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came to Damascus. The certain man, Ananias, devout man according to the law, having good testimony of all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And that same hour I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men what you have seen and heard. Verse 16. And now, why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So Saul is baptized into the faith. There's a, a clear moment of conversion in Saul's life. In fact, it's so clear and so concise that Saul... And everything that he was, once he becomes a follower of Jesus Christ, it's much like when God calls Abram. And he pulls Abram aside and he says, hey, I want a covenant with you, Abram. 
And I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth through you. All who bless you will be blessed. Those who curse you will be cursed. Of course, he, he establishes a sign of that covenant. And also in that sign of the covenant, he does something pretty amazing. He renames him to Abraham. And Saul has this conversion moment. And it's like God says, all that you were before Saul is changing in this moment. And he becomes known as Paul. That's a clear conversion. Not only is everything about him changed, I mean, his actual name has even changed. Now, I'm not saying that we should go and say, God, what's my new name? As a matter of fact, do you know that when we get to heaven, that every single one of us will receive a precious stone that will have a name on it that will be our name that only we will know? So it's already been decreed. It may not be that you were handed like, John, here's your new name. But it's been decreed. And one day you will see him face to face and he will. Have we had a moment of conversion that has radically transformed who we were? Can you look at your life and see a moment of, you see life patterns that at one point change and they're no longer the same. And now new life patterns have been formed. Has there been the moment of conversion? Jesus confronts the Pharisees. He tells them this. Blind Pharisee, he's referring to their religion. He's referring to all the acts of religion that they do. And he views it as a cup. How many of you guys drank coffee this morning? Did any of you guys bother to look inside your cup before you poured the coffee into it? <laughs> Thanks. Let me ask you a question. How many of you would drink the coffee out of that cup if it was all crusty and gross? Like, what if we just decided to recycle all the cups and next week you showed up and we didn't clean the cup on the inside? We just restacked them again. How many of you would want to use that cup again? It would be gross, wouldn't it? And Jesus is creating a metaphor for us to look at ourselves, that we are this cup. And religion tries to work its way outward in. We do things to make us look better, right? So we haven't, maybe some of us haven't had a moment of conversion, but we attempt to look converted, right? We aren't authentic. That's how we put religion on. But it's a fabrication. It's Big K trying to be Coca-Cola. You know what else we do? We do this. We haven't gone through the authentic. We haven't gone through the authentic. We're packing this bad boy. And we're worried that people are going to notice that we don't have the real Coca-Cola, right? We're coming to church and somebody's going to notice that's Big K at some point. Right? Everybody's drinking the Coca-Cola and you try to get away with it for as long as you can. But you know eventually someone's going to notice, dude, that's Big K. Right? So we distract them, right? We distract them with how good we look and how we act. <laughs> Maybe you literally do wear your Christian t-shirt. But this would be our... You know, the, the Bible refers to a robe of righteousness. I like to call this the robe of self-righteousness. Where we like to put on our good works, right? And don't many of us refer to the teachings of Paul where we say, we put off the old, the old man, the old works, we put on the new. And yes, that is part of what we do, but you can't do it apart from Christ. Apart from the moments of conversion, apart from Jesus working on the inside and out. And so if all we do is put on the goodness, then all we're doing is wearing our religion. And some of us go to great lengths to make sure other people know, I've got the authentic. But in reality, you're still just drinking big cake. So Jesus confronts that, and he tells them this. Matthew 23, 26, he says, Blind Pharisees, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. 
See, religion wants to clean the outside so that when you look at it, it looks great. But the inside is crusty and gross and has not been touched. That is the issue of conversion. If we have wrapped our life with religion, it might look like everybody else that has been converted on the outside, but inwardly, we haven't been changed. And Jesus makes clear, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, that that's all that counts. Jesus says this in Matthew 16, 24. Here's the question. How many of us are following Jesus? Now here's going to be the real issue for us then. This scripture is going to help us determine whether we've got the real Coca-Cola walk with Jesus or how many of us have been posing with the Coca-Cola, pretending to have it. I just want to tell you, I'm just going to read the scripture. This is not my interjection to it. This is just what Jesus says, all right? Listen to this. This is the call of Jesus. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, anyone desire to come after Jesus? Yes. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? There is a question. This one I like to refer to as popular American Christianity. Come to church, sprinkle on some good positive teaching into your life, do some good works, volunteer your time, give some money to the poor, and you'll be an American Christian. And people feel good about that. But that's not the call of Jesus. His call if you want to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Let's talk about that for just a minute. Deny yourself. In choosing Jesus, we must not choose us. Does that make sense? In order to choose him, we have to purpose to say no to self. There's the choice. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I really like me. And I'm not asking if you like me, but do you like you? We love ourselves, right? Nobody loves you like you. We don't want to be inconvenienced. We don't want to, we don't want to have difficulty in life. But the prerequisite to following Jesus is that you first must not choose you. Secondly, take up a cross. Everybody look at the cross back there. If we had a modern sign of the cross, you know, a lot of us love to wear our little cross on our necklace, right? If we had a modern sign today of the cross, a symbol of death, you would be an electric chair. How'd you like to be one of those people walking around with a little gold-plated electric chair on your <laughs> necklace? It's the emblem of death. It's a symbol of death. So deny yourself, take up your cross. So Jesus is saying, and he was clear with all of his disciples, in authentic Christianity, I've got a cross. Well, how many of you guys have read the whole story? Jesus actually carries that cross to a hill and gets on that cross and dies. Yeah? You read the story? You familiar with it? He carries the cross and he dies. And he says, and by the way, take your cross and follow me. Where are you going? Oh, well, I'm going to go die. Hmm, I don't know if I want to join that cult. That's the call of Christianity. There is no other call. I want to be clear that when we follow Jesus, it's willfully saying no to me. I'm following you and I see that where you went is straight to death. That must be where I'm going. That's a tough teaching. You see why so many people, when Jesus was walking the face of the earth, were offended by his teachings? 
We have to separate the American ideology of Christianity and discover the authentic call. But when we follow Christ in an authentic way, you know what happens? We lose the fear of death. We lose the fear of man. We lose the fear that rules this world. Because you're already dead. Right? Does that make sense? And that's why when you look through church history, when they were persecuting the Christians, they died willingly. They were already dead. Yeah, this is a tough saying and it's a tough teaching, but I think it's worth us placing valuation. Where is our walk with Christ? Is it all about us and all about what I get out of my walk with God? Or is it that we have really had a conversion with Christ? Because I'll submit this. Biblically, when you look at every person who followed Jesus, when they were converted, they laid their life down. And I just want us to begin to ponder these things. That if we love Jesus and we've chosen Him, then in choosing Him, we purpose to not choose us. We purpose to say yes to picking up our cross, whatever that may be. We don't have enough time to get into expounding on all the different areas of what denying ourself may be and carrying our own cross, but what it does mean ultimately is that we die to self. I don't know about you guys, but every day I get out of bed, the first thing I have to do is kill Rod. Because Rod, when he runs the rule, when he rules the roost, he's horrible. I'm just being honest. Rod is a bad husband. Rod is a bad father. Rod is not a good guy. But when that Rod gets put to death, and the one that, when I allow Christ to lead me, and I follow him, and I put myself behind and I die to myself and I follow him. That rod is a good husband. That rod loves his family. That rod is willing to lay himself down for his kids. And trust me, my kids know when the other rod has got up and not been put to death. My wife is aware when that rod has made it out of the bed. And it's crystal clear when he's been put to death too. Because in that is life for my wife. Is life for my children. Is life for all of you. Father, I pray in Jesus' name.